So you've probably seen the news already. Benil Dariush against Armin Sarukian happening. And then below that, you've got another five-round fight. And remember, this is on a fight night card. This is the type of thing you see on a pay-per-view card. But what makes it even better is it's not even a title fight and they've made it five rounds. They need to do that for more co-main events that look interesting or do it for a co-main event where it's like for a title eliminator, for example. They should have done it with Kamara Usman and Hamzat Shemaev. I know they couldn't at that time, but if that was a five round fight, we all know what would have happened. And they need to start doing more of that for the co-main events. And below this card, you've got people like Sean Brady against Kelvin Gastelum, and you've got Rob Font against Davison Figueredo. Not a lot of people are really talking about that fight. And this card already reminds me of UFC 272, where you've got a really good main card. But on the prelims on this card, you might not think it's that good. But the main card is very good. And I want to start off by talking about Benil Dariush against Armin Sarukian. And a lot of you are probably going to say Armin Sarukian should win this fight. But I actually think Benil Dariush is going to win the fight. And I'm actually quite confident in it. And you'll watch the last fight with Dariush and Charles Oliveira and be like, Oh, he might be a bit chinny, he got caught and he got blitzed early, but that's Charles Oliveira. Charles Oliveira and Makashev are levels above a lot of the fighters in the lightweight division. Armin Sarukian, you could argue, has got title potential. Like, look at that fight he had with, what's his name, Makashev with them elite scrambles. But looking at the top five, I don't know if I can say that until he fights a guy like Benil Dariush. And if he can go out there and beat a guy like Benil Dariush, then maybe you can say that. But... I actually think in this fight with Benil Dariush, it's a very hard fight for him because if you watch Armin Sarukian when he's striking, he's usually a fast starter. He likes to come out at you, popping out that jab, applying a lot of pressure, working those body kicks to the body. I don't know why I just said that. And then shoots on you and gets you against the cage. You cannot do that against Benil Dariush. Look what happened when Mateus Gamrot decided, right, start of the fight. I'm going to be very fast, like he fought that fight like in a panicky type of mode where he was shooting on him constantly, he wasn't really like taking his time, then shooting, he was going in for it and Benil Dariush has got very good reaction time and a very good scrambling ability on the ground so even if you did think Sarukin would drop Dariush, I don't think he will, but if he did or if he tried to like jump on top of Dariush. Dariush is so good at moving on the ground, like grabbing a heel hook and then spinning his body round and then trying to take the back. Very good scrambles. And so is Armin Sarukin. Like you could say the same thing. Showing good scrambles in the Mateus Gamrot fight. Showed good scrambles in the Islam Makashev fight. And I know it was years ago, but I do believe the striking edge just goes to Benil Dariush. And you might say Armin Sarukin's got the better wrestling advantage, but I think where it will cancel out is with the jiu-jitsu of Dariush. Sarukin loves to TKO the opponent by bringing them down and looking to finish people there. He doesn't really finish people standing up on the feet. He can do it, but I know he's not going to do that to a guy like Benil Dariush because Dariush, he likes to not move his head a lot. He's a really awkward fighter, but when he connects on your chin with that overhand like he likes to do in every fight, it will wobble you. And we saw in the fight with Armin Sarukin and Jaquim Silva, I'm not going to sit here first of all and say Armin Sarukin's got a suspect chin. Like, most of the top five lightweights have all been caught with a great shot at one point in a fight and they've been drunk. It's normal. You're fighting the top level guys. It was a perfect shot on the chin. And if anything, it's actually quite a good chin to not get knocked out by that. And yes, I know he was meant to go out there and dominate him, which he did do and not take any damage. But it was like a flash moment in the fight. He did nothing else apart from that. Um, flash hook so I don't want to hear anything about him having a bad chin or anything if anything I think it's actually quite good to survive that but I think Benil Dariush is more technical than what's his name Yaquim Silva so him finding that punch or overhand onto Armin Sarukin he's going to have a better chance of landing it with more success and if he does drop Armin Sarukin he can use that elite level jiu-jitsu he's got and bring it down to the ground so that is why I do think Benil Dariush has got a very good chance of beating Armin Sarukian. And I think he will do it. And if he can do it, remember, he needs to be looking at fighting another ranked guy, like maybe either a Poirier. Probably not a Gaethje, because Gaethje's only looking at fighting really high up. But Poirier, maybe if he wants to do it. It depends. But I just think, in my opinion, it's going to be harder for him to do it against Benil Dariush. Plus, 
The new Darish is much taller than him. Well, maybe not much taller, but 5'10 to 5'7. It's harder to take down the taller guy, and especially when he's taller and he's got extremely good takedown defense. Imagine dealing with all those takedowns from Gamera. Yeah, Rahman Sarukin should have beat Gamera, but we're not going to do MMA math here. So, I do think that was impressive, stopping all of them. I think it will do something similar to Armin Saruki, and it will cancel out, and it will be a striking battle on the feet where they might go to the ground at one point, but it will be like loads of scrambling. No one will hold like one dominant position unless one of them gets knocked down and there'll be days. The only time where I see that happening. And I think Benil Dariush might, and I say might, be able to finish Armin Saruki late into the fight, like a round four finish, because... Armin Sarukin has showed that in fights, as good as he is, he can slow down. Like, you can have a good first two rounds, and then he might get a bit complacent in the third, or get a bit tired, and then make a mistake. And you can't do that against Benil Dariush, because Benil Dariush, although he has not been to five rounds, I believe from what I've seen, his cardio is quite good. Like, he dropped Gamera in the third round, and he looked comfortable in there. He didn't look like he was breathing out through the mouth and panicking or anything. So I do think he's going to beat Armin Sarukin, but you can disagree. And then we've got Dan Hooker against, what's his name? Bobby Green. This fight, I think, will be way more entertaining than Benil Dariush, Armin Sarukin. I'm actually looking forward to that, even though it means less than Benil Dariush and Armin Sarukin, because of the matchup. You've got a guy who, in Bobby Green, hands down, non-telegraph punches are going to be coming at Dan Hooker. I can see Dan Hooker being caught very early. But as we saw in the Jared Gordon fight and in the Drew Dober fight, Bobby Green can start off again quite fast. Dan Hooker can start off quite slow, which is why we saw him get TKO'd against Arnold Allen and we've seen him take some big shots early. But one thing he has got is that not only determination factor in him, Great chin, heart in him to keep coming forward even though he's absorbing a lot of pressure. Like Jalen Turner, he did not win that fight, but he lost that fight because of cardio. And because Dan Hooker can eat it all and keep coming forward and pressure you. And if that's Bobby Green, Jared Gordon was out striking him at one point. Yes, Bobby Green started off better, but he was starting to fade in that fight. And if you start to fade against a guy like Dan Hooker, Dan Hooker will take advantage of you like he did to Jalen Turner. And remember, he was fading in the first round a little bit to Jared Gordon. And Jared Gordon hits hard. But Dan Hooker, he can hit hard and he can hit you with combinations. And I think that's where, in a five round fight, I think Bobby Green, you might not believe me, I think he might gas in the fight because Dan Hooker will come to the body as well. And I don't want to hear people say Arnold Allen KO'd him, therefore he has a bad chin. It was a TKO and you've got to remember, he was cutting down at featherweight, did not look healthy. So... Against Bobby Green, Bobby Green's going to fade hands down. I can just see a knockout written all over this because he'll tire him with those front kicks to the body like he did to Puelles. And he did throw quite a few punches and kicks to the body against Jalen Turner. And he'll do the same thing to Bobby Green. And I think Bobby Green with the age as well, it's about time where he will get put out because I don't think he's going to be able to maintain that volume at that age for five rounds against a guy like Dan Hooker who's not going to just back up and allow you to piece him up or look away from punches like Tony Ferguson. That won't happen. So, yeah, I do think Dan Hooker is going to win the fight via KO, but I think it'll be later, like round three, maybe round four. And then we have Sean Brady against, what's his name? Kelvin Gastelum. This fight, I think, is quite underrated, and I'm seeing a lot of people underrate Sean Brady because he got TKO'd on the feet against Blau Muhammad. Remember, when you have two people from the same fighting background, sometimes it will cancel out and they'll end up doing things that they shouldn't be doing. Israel Adesanya and Alex Pereira at one point, both strikers end up grappling. I know Adesanya initiated it, but it happened. And then you have Colby Usman, both wrestlers. Both go out there and start striking with each other. And I know Usman likes to strike more than grapple a lot of the time. But it happens and this is a fight where you haven't got that situation. You've got the orthodox Sean Brady against the Southpaw in Kelvin Gastelum. And the reason I brought up orthodox versus Southpaw is he tends to get the most takedowns against the Southpaw fighter. He got five against Michael Chiesa. Michael Chiesa is a guy where people don't just take him down over and over and over again. But Sean Brady did. And I believe... 
one theory I've got, you wrestlers might be able to correct me, but when you are a orthodox fighter coming up against a southpaw wrestler, the traditional way of doing the single leg, getting that lead leg on the outside, and remember, the southpaw fighter's a lead leg, it's going to be closer to your lead leg, so by making that step, you haven't got to make like an inside step and then grab hold of the leg. You can make that outside step and then penetrate forward and then grab the leg of your opponent and then bring it into you to do the single leg. Compared to the orthodox, it's on the opposite side. So you have to come more to the middle or you're going to have to switch to a southpaw if you want to do a single leg to get a better penetration and do that. Or what you could do is switch to southpaw and then try and do a single leg. But no fighters are looking to do that. They want to stay in the same stance and then shoot on you. And he did, and it worked over and over again. And I think this will work against Kelvin Gastelum because when he comes up against a very strong grappler, he tends to get taken down over and over and over again. Look at the Chris Weidman fight. He was getting taken down and getting controlled a lot. And even Robert Whittaker, a guy who is not known for shooting on people, is a very good defensive wrestler, Josh Emmett, like that. He doesn't shoot on people, but against Gastelum, it looked like he was bullying him in terms of wrestling, throwing him all over the shop. Brady has beaten Craig Jones at grappling, and you might be like, he's a jiu-jitsu guy. It doesn't matter, he's still got a grapple in jiu-jitsu, and he's beating him to a decision. Volkanovski's trainer. That is good, in my opinion, who I believe might be a bit bigger than Brady. And he is a good grappler, but it was just that Bilal Muhammad fight was embarrassing. We know he can't strike. If he keeps it on the feet with Gastelum, he will be put out cold, not even TKO'd, out cold. But I don't think he will. I think him being a southpaw, he's going to get a lot of takedowns, and it worked against Michael Chiesa. Even though Chiesa had a moment in the fight where he hit him with like a three-piece combination, he didn't do much in the fight, and we know Michael Chiesa don't hit hard. So I think he's going to get him down. And once he gets him down, Gastelum won't get back up. And I think that's how he'll win the fight by a submission or a decision. But I am going to pick him to do it by submission. And yeah, so I just wanted to talk about a few of them fights that are coming up. So thank you for watching. Talk to you soon.